Welcome to those of you who are just joining us. Uh, if my morning was anything like anybody else's, it was quite exciting. So, and I love Dr. Mason as a lunch speaker. And without further ado, let's get to our second plenary. This morning was about cause and effect. This afternoon is about what works, options and possibilities, okay? And I think it ties in well with what Dr. Mason talked about. We know what the that is. He talked about the why. Hopefully we can spend the rest of the day together talking about what do we do about it. Now that we know what it is, why it is, what can each one of us in this room do about it to make it better. And to help us with that, we have folks who have been working to do just that and that is make it better. So uh, let me introduce our panelists. Mark Davis, who joined the Calumet Police Department in August of 2002 after serving 32 years with the Chicago Police Department. He rose through the ranks from patrol officer to commander of the Gresham, that is the 6th District, and commander of the Office of Emergency Management and Communications. Chief Davis has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Chicago State University and a master's degree in public administration from Illinois Institute of Technology. Chief Davis is also the recipient of the Chicago Police Department Superintendent's Award of Merit for his contribution to the Chicago Public Schools Driver Education Program and he is the author of the novel Race Traders. Welcome. Chief Davis. Of course, I did not alphabetize this, so now I'm totally confused. Okay, Robert Spicer is the cultural, culture and climate specialist at Christian Finger High School. Since 2009, Robert has worked with the school and wider community in implementing restorative justice. Through his efforts, restorative justice has turned the school culture towards healing and restoration. Since implementing restorative practices, there was a, I was gonna say 30, that's an eight, 80%, 80% drop in misconduct. Arrests are down from 375 in 2009, and yes, I'm repeating, 375 in 2009 to less than 15 this year. And the freshman on track, which is a key indicator of students' ability to graduate in four years, went from 40% to 75%. Robert has been on CNN, Chicago Tonight, and WBEZ uh, sharing about the power of restorative justice and travels all over the United States, sharing with communities the power of restorative justice. So welcome. I direct the Institute on Public Safety and Social Justice at the Adler School. Um, and I have a PhD in clinical and community psychology from DePaul University. And I don't know all the other great things that people said, but that's some of what I do. Thank you. And I apologize for that. Um, Philip Jackson, but I do have the back of the floor. Philip Jackson has dedicated his life to providing opportunities for and improving the life quality of others. During his career, Mr. Jackson has been vice president and director of operations for one of Chicago's oldest and largest chain of booksellers. He was president of EFMS, a family run business. He was also assistant budget director for the city of Chicago. Chief of Staff for Chicago Public Schools, Chief Executive Officer for the Chicago Housing Authority, Chief of Education for the City of Chicago, CEO of Boys and Girls Clubs of Chicago, and is currently Executive Director of the Black Star Project, which he founded. And that is designed to help children and students realize their educational potential in life. Mr. Jackson has received national attention and recognition for his work on eliminating the racial academic achievement gap. He was named one of the Chicago Defenders 50 Men of Excellence 
and most recently honored by the White House as a champion of change for educational excellence for African Americans. Our afternoon panel. All right, so all of you guys sound pretty good on paper, all right. Um, but Chief Davis, as you know, if you were in Chicago for 32 years, that there is a um, relationship between the Chicago Police Department and communities of color that is at best tenuous. Um, and there are people that believe that the police department likes it that way and has not done much to make that relationship better. Um, what's your response to that? I don't know if I could speak for the Chicago Police Department because I've been gone for the last 11 years. But as a young man um, growing up in the city of Chicago, I had some experiences with the Chicago Police Department that were, you know, kind of life changing. Um, I had a situation as a 17-year-old a where I was arrested and assaulted by the police um, and charged with, you know, resisting arrest and battery to the police. I can't say that the police were all wrong because I was 17, uh, growing up uh, hostile, angry um, in society. And this particular incident uh, uh, happened one summer night on the south side. Um, I don't think it, it influenced me to view the police department because it, there were a lot of issues in the police department that needed to be addressed and training was one of them. Uh, you're right, this, it has been a, a very, very difficult situation between the Chicago police and the community. I think when, when I was commander, we tried to address that with our community policing program. And in my district, you know, I, I, I knew that that existed. And I did a lot of things to try to bring the community together. I knew that there was a real serious problem between young people and the police because there were so many incidents that happened. Uh, the most famous, I think you will all remember, would be the Tanya Haggerty incident, where uh, the police lack of training and the police and, and citizen also caused the young lady to lose her life. And then later on that same night, uh, young, another young man, African American man, Robert Russ, he lost his life as a result of a conflict with the police. So I tried to uh, create a strategy with Paul Vallis where, because we in the sixth district, we held uh, monthly meetings with the high schools. We had four high schools, and we knew that there was some distance between the youth and the police department. So we invited them once a month to come to the police station, or we'd go to the high school when we offered them refreshments, and we would sit down, and that was a battle. That was a battlefield, and we learned a great deal. And from that, we were able to create this program, which is now, I understand, um, and at the time, the, 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 the Chicago Board of Education implemented the program where before each child can get their driver's license, they had to take this, this course on uh, tips with how to conduct yourself when you were uh, coming in contact with the police. And I think it was a very, very effective program. I hope that it saved some child from losing his life from not knowing how to conduct himself when stopped with, by the police. Uh, during this, this, tr this, this process, we went over issues on how they should conduct themselves to prevent tragedy and when uh, they're stopped by the police. Um, I can't say, you know, uh, how much our, the relationship has improved, but we all know that the issue is it's still present and there's still a lot of work that has to be done. Would you share with the audience what you are doing in your present position then? Uh, because some of those same issues uh, are alive in the South Suburban communities as well as in the city proper. I'm in the village of Cagman Park, which is about 8,500. It's a very small police department. Um, we don't have the resources to really create programs like the one with the Chicago Public Schools. And I don't have any high schools. I, we are, I, I am in a high school district. I think it's 218, which takes in Richards and Eisenhower and Shepherd High School. Uh, but I'm not that active at that level because I don't have a high school, so I don't have to be bothered with some of the problems that 
maybe a, 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 a community that has a high school. We're just small and we deal with the small local problems of that small community. And as a, uh, well, let me ask you this because everybody wants to know. You said that the, uh, you wouldn't blame the police because you were 17 and you were angry. My question is, were you committing an offense? Yeah, that's, it's a, <laughs> here, here. <laughs> Here, here's the statute run. I mean, I'm not asking. Here, he said he was 17. Here, here's the here's the offense. The offense was, uh, it's, it's a, it's, no, no, I wasn't I wasn't committing a criminal offense. It's a behavior offense. It's called disorderly conduct, which you can just label that over any any type of behavior in the community if they can't. If you couldn't put a, a criminal charge on disorderly conduct would always justify. Call it P.O. on a cop. Okay. Um, all right. I just, I, <laughs> yeah. I knew people wanted to know that because he had said it, right? So, um, what would you, if there were a training program that you could implement, um, what's, what are the key, the top three components that would be a successful training program for police officers to effectively deal with the community? Well, I don't know. What I want to say today to everybody at this, uh, this symposium was what, when I was asked to, to, to be a member of it, uh, and, and I think you asked me um, to sit on a panel for solutions. And uh, I pondered that, I'm like, solutions to the violence, what can we do to, to, you know, to help prevent some of the things that are happening with, with our young kids? And, um, you know, I looked around internet, you know, I did a lot of different looking for an answer. And I was talking to a friend of mine, um, one day he's an electrician for the uh, city of Chicago. And he said he was in the school and um, he uh, was doing some work and he noticed how the little boys were, you know, watching him and paying attention to him because he was a black professional in the school. So he noticed that something was absent. And uh, he asked the principal, he says, well, where are the male teachers in the school? And she says, oh, we, we don't have any. And he says, wow, you know, I mean, this is an elementary school. These little boys don't get any uh, mentoring, any direction. They don't see a, a male, a black male in the classroom. And what I started to look for was, why is that? Um, my daughter is a uh, district superintendent for District 149, and she kind of gave me a little, you know, uh, statistics. and. Uh, she stated that they're like 83% of the teachers in the public schools are, are women um, and that you may have three to five males in the school. So what I decided to do was say, well, maybe to, to start to address that shortage, what could be done? And I came up, my response was that um, I think we need to start a recruitment program for male teachers in the public schools in the elementary level. I says, well, why is it like that now? It's because male teachers elect to teach in high schools because there are more incentives for them to teach in the high school. And I think that we need to reverse that and offer, you know, they do a lot of recruiting, you know, for the high schools and colleges. The, the city of Chicago and the public school system should start to a, a very, uh, drastic program to, to recruit young males to teach in the elementary levels because here you would get with that these children would at third grade second grade they would see a male dressed up like Phil and myself you know uh, someone who speaks well who has experience who's got a college education and he didn't get it because you know by accident he got it through sheer determination and, and, and applying himself, and he could take this and, 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 and instill this in these young boys as he comes to school every day. And they would get this every day. And it, it, it sounds like it may be pie in the sky, but I think if, if we really, really, really attack this problem by trying to recruit young male teachers of character and strength to come in these classrooms and offer them some incentives that would make them, you know, not jump at the option of going to the high school, but go to the grammar school because now you're going to be like raising, you know, plants, little ducks or something to make them grow and teach them and show them, 
discipline them and show them what it is to be a, a responsible, determined young man and growing up in the city of Chicago. So with that, um, any other solutions that come to mind? You said you pondered this and you, you know, you've obviously discussed it and thought about it before coming here today. Can you give us one more think about this? Um, well, I think nationally, not just the city of Chicago, but nationally, there should be a, a rigorous program to recruit teachers to teach, male teachers to teach in the, in the elementary school. And you know, we can start in Chicago, but I think in the college level nationally, it should be some program that uh, would have would the, as much uh, intensity as they have for recruiting a football player or basketball player is to recruit a young teacher to come in there and bring these kids up and instill in them some quality male behavior uh, patterns. Um, I'm going to turn now and let Ms. Quintana, uh, I know you have, you have a presentation. Okay, so I will turn it over at this point to Ms. Quintana. Hi. Um, I completely changed my presentation based on this morning's um, presentation because it covered too much of what I had. So I'm going to give you my best wisdom as of 8.30 this morning. So here, <laughs> all right, so I really was thinking about what are the best options and solutions uh, to really provide um, alternatives to youth criminalization. And I really think that there's this, uh, this false dichotomy that goes on um, in terms of our beliefs. And I think that beliefs and dollars really drive all of our policy and action around what we do with young people. And I think that uh, there's one belief that says we must control this violence with suppression. And even if, it's, uh, n even if it's not direct violence, sometimes we think of like any sort of illegal activity as potentially contributing to violence, right? And so the belief underneath that, uh, especially, is that youth of color are dangerous predators. This is, the, this is the dangerous belief under that. The second one is we belong to each other, right? And the belief uh, underneath that is that our children are sacred and they deserve our greatest investment and resources, especially when they're in danger. And when I mean especially when they're in danger, it's not like somebody attacking them, it's also if they're angry, if they're uh, given to violence themselves, that's a red flag and they need help, right? And so these are the two belief systems. And if you think of the interventions that are going on right now um, for youth, what belief system are we working from and why? So what's the adult responsibility? Because sometimes I go, I, I, I'm in the juvenile detention center every week, and um, I do a violence prevention group, and I also do visit, visits for kids who don't get visits. And um, sometimes, you know, the situation there is just, like, not promoting their development at all. And it's frustrating for me. And I say, I'm really sorry. That this is the best that adults came up with for you, right? And I think we're like, I'm like a little embarrassed to be an adult. Like we got to rep better for the adults in the crowd, for the grown-ups, right? So what do we as grown-ups owe kids, right? So if we fail to educate, support, and protect our children, they'll continue to arm themselves. I always ask shooters, why do you pick up guns? To protect ourselves, just as we were hearing earlier this morning. Would you rather be caught with it or without it, right? They don't feel protected. They don't feel safe. So their well-being as well as ours demands interpersonal connection like real connection and investment so when we wonder like how do you fight violence that's how it's really unbelievably simple but also incredibly difficult in terms of how you execute it and align systems so that they're the most um, positive possible so I talk about uh, a lot about creating an industry of peace um, with a philosophy underneath it um, that's all about restorative justice. And I know that the good uh, Reverend Spicer will be talking about restorative justice later. Um, and I'm definitely not going to steal his thunder. But I do think about restorative justice as 
uh, restoring and transforming all people so that they can live at their highest level of functioning within community among us, right? And that we need to change the thinking from what's wrong with you to what happened to you and how can I help, right? So there is that interconnectivity and also that belief of you're worth my investment. There's this idea sometimes that drives me a little bit crazy that adults, when you talk to a kid, a kid who um, is locked up or even an adult who's locked up or something, there's sometimes a judgment of like, why are you, why are you talking to that? You know, he's just, he's just playing you. He wants something from you. And it's like, I'm sure he does. <laughs> he wants connection and attention and a conversation. And I think um, there is kind of a, 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 what I think is a counterproductive uh, way that some people cope with that situation of dehumanizing people. And I think we need to very actively humanize everyone who is human. Does that make sense? All right. So here's some key industry, uh, some key industry players, peace industry key players, sorry. So if there's like baseball cards of like, you know, peace industry key players, these are some of the roles that they would play. And um, I think community members obviously are really key. I think a lot of times uh, community members abdicate all security to um, police. And I think that's a mistake, right? Um, and I think we need to kind of talk to each other more, right? And outreach workers and others who connect the disconnected are incredibly valuable. I, I worked, um, I directed the evaluation for ceasefire for 12 years. And um, in doing so, I also helped to create the training um, for the outreach workers. And I really, what I came to appreciate about ceasefire, um, where I first coined the term uh, peace industry, um, was that there are so many people who basically felt like they were going to live and die in the system. And that peace industry, the ability to be trained as a professional, as an outreach worker who was paid to promote peace within their community, was something that was so unbelievably transformative, not just for them, but for all of the people with whom they live. And I think that um, really actively finding people who can connect the disconnected will serve us like unbelievably. It, and it's so cost effective. Health educators have a huge role to play um, because there's so much information that can get out there. We've been talking about ACEs, ACEs, ACEs. And um, I think really knowing more um, about uh, neurobiology, about this basic science of ACEs, about best practices to use, about how to create effective trauma-informed environments, we can put that to great use in terms of making things better to promote human development. So, um, you know, also I want to give a huge shout out to service providers that serve those who most need them. What happens with a lot of service providers is something called creaming, that they'll serve people that are easy to serve, people that already have disability, people that already have a medical card, people that have insurance, people that have advocates. And a big shout out, because it's about 10 times harder, maybe more, um, to serve people that really, really need it and don't have any of that stuff. Because the realities of their life are such that they're not organized to the point of having those things or don't have the resources, never had the resources, whatever. But I'm telling you, those people that demand 10 times more, it's worth the effort. It's worth the effort. Um, and for people who provide medical health, attention, support, advocacy, who fight tooth and nail for a clinic in their neighborhood, right on, we need you. Now, I want to talk about what are trauma-informed environments. Has anybody heard this phrase, trauma-informed? A lot of people hear that, right? But then what does it mean? Um, you know, so trauma-informed environments, they really understand that trauma is incredibly common. Um, most people have undergone some sort of traumatic incident in their lives, and which can be triggered. Um, let me explain. I'm going to talk uh, like a couple minutes. I don't know who the timekeeper is, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the brain. Thank you. 
I, I, wanna, I just want to talk a minute about the brain, all right? Um, there's something called the amygdala in your brain that is like the ooh, 911 center, like ooh, fight or flight, something happens, the amygdala goes off and is like, you better get out, right? Or you better fight back or whatever. That's the amygdala. Then, you know, in order for the amygdala to be able to like calm down and be like, you know what, I need to calm down. I, I need to like, you know, not get so upset. That signal has to get all the way to something called the prefrontal cortex, right? So did you ever feel threatened and then you tried to jerk away real quick and then you realized it wasn't a real threat and you calmed down? That little jerk away, that's the amygdala and the time that you calm down, that's a prefrontal cortex. So now people know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, in between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, guess what you go through? You go through the section of the brain, the hippocampus, where you got all your memories. Tons of memories, right? So I want you to think about being a kid and somebody comes up to you and maybe they're joking and they smack you, but you got about 100 incidents of serious threat going on that you're trying to go through before you can mediate that with uh, the higher thinking of the prefrontal cortex. That's a long walk through a lot of bad memories, right? And so that's really hard for when your amygdala is set off for you to just be real chill about it and be like, oh, they're, they're kidding because that's not what the hundred other situations before that really tell you. You see what I'm saying? So like that's just a little bit of information that helps this whole room of people be a little bit more trauma informed. It's a little bit of information about the way that trauma affects people's lives in a way that we can like break it down and understand it and be like, oh, that makes sense. When people are really hot and bothered, we need to wait a minute we need to say, you know what? We need some time. I'm too hot about this. I'm too triggered. Uh, my, you know, my, my hippocampus is steady, like going crazy with all these bad memories. I can't think. I can't think rationally right now. And that's a beautiful conversation to have because it provides so much clarity and a real opportunity for people to step back and be like, all right, that's trauma, inf that's trauma informed care, right? That's trauma informed care. So it really understands limitations people may have, and it really pr helps them to promote their strengths because you, you, you got an understanding of being like, you know what, let's wait an hour to talk about this, or, you know? All right, now, a lot of times when you talk about trauma, there's something else I wanna talk about. People talk a lot about like, oh, so if they've been through something, you just, they're not accountable for anything they do. That's not true. The, the, you know, the flip side of understanding trauma is not just giving everybody who's traumatized a pass. That doesn't help anyone. You need to keep environments safe. People need to be safe. Everyone needs to be safe, right? Including the person who's traumatized. And so I've, I've been um, really working to develop something called therapeutic accountability because I believe strongly that zero tolerance policies don't provide a lasting peace. Like, zero tolerance policies kind of kick people out, leave them to their own defenses, and they're the people with the fewest resources anyway, right? Right, I can get an amen from this crowd, I know it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the idea behind therapeutic accountability is really helping to, to understand the difference of when you need to remove somebody from a situation give them time to calm down, but then engage in a restorative process where people can work stuff out together and ultimately come back into the community as a whole community. That's what we need. We need that belonging, that support. And so that's a, a, a bunch of practices that, um, that I'm kind of compiling. Um, so here's a, a bunch of different kinds of restorative practices. Um, hospitality and accompaniment are something that uh, Father Dave Kelly talks a lot about, that whenever you have a kid that comes in, especially a court-involved kid, they're already pretty marginalized and that they need places where they actually, where that are actually hospitable to them because the world is an incredibly hostile place to court-involved kids, incredibly, because it's so easy to blame them and they're very vulnerable. And so hospitality and accompany, anything that has hospitality where you're welcome, and then you, accompaniment means walking with people. And I mean like that deep spiritual but also practical walk. Like, yeah, I'm going to help you to get your ID. And I'm going to help you to get back into school. 
and I'm going to advocate for you even though you're rude and your pants are sagging and, you know, you, like, are writing on the desk that I'm sitting in front of right now, you know, right? That's hospitality and accompaniment that in a deep way, right? But then there's all these other practices um, like peer juries, peace circles, community service that actually has to do with whatever they were doing um, wrong that helps people to kind of transform themselves. There's victim offender conferencing, family group con conferencing, restorative chats. There's all these practices and all of those are trauma informed. So here's my proposal that community safety, true community safety depends upon the retrieval and the restoration of those of us with the deepest spirit wounds. People that have the most trouble, that whose hippocampus is constantly flashing because they got PTSD and you can't quiet down, right? Those are the people we need to retrieve. Those are the people we need to go back, collect them, work with them, right? So in order to do this, we don't have any money, do we? Does anybody here have any money? I'm going to talk to you after. You do. But um, we need some revolutionary reallocation, right? So um, my, my um, thought is that it's, you know, a lot of the money is our money, right? This is our state. It's our money. We should, we should spend it the way we think it should be spent on, and let's spend it wisely, right? So we really need to demand that interventions increase human potential. We don't need any more interventions that decrease or curtail human potential, that degrade communities, that degrade families. We need to be lifted up, not pushed down, right? And so demanding that is like, oh, are you going to fund this? Oh, wait. You know, wouldn't it be better to have a, like a peace room in a high school than a police room in a high school? Isn't it better to have an outreach worker responding uh, than a trauma surgeon responding. It's way cheaper to people. That's what I mean by more cost effective. There's all these things where we can, isn't it better to have a peer jury and have uh, some real funded training around peacemaking than one extra security guard at a high school, right? That's what I'm talking about. We need some revolutionary reallocation in hospitals, schools, Detention centers, community centers, and neighborhoods all give us huge opportunities to make these reallocations and to, to demand that human potential is something that we invest in. So. And a personal, I want to give you my personal thanks. That's probably the best explanation I have ever heard for, well, I just snapped. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, okay, Mr. Jackson says he's ready. Um, okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. First, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Vince Price, who is a Black Star mentor. Now, that means something, Vince Price. <laughs> what that means is that he is a solution. And uh, Chief Davis said he's been trying to become a Black Star mentor for five years, he told me. So can you guys please connect and, and make that happen? <laughs> thank you. I'd like to also thank Dr. Johnson, who is in the audience. He's been supporting the work of uh, Dr. Waldo Johnson, has been supporting the work of Black Star and doing great work. <laughs> My brother from the block, Keith Tate, is up there in the crowd. Keith, hello, sir. Working out in the community, Chatham Avalon Community Council. And Judge Marilyn Johnson is, boy, she kept me out of jail when I was at CPS. <laughs> 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 she, she kept telling me, Phil, you're going to do serious time. So, <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, you ask, why is there so much violence in Chicago? Well, let me tell you why. You only need to look at the super high unemployment rates in Chicago. 52% of black men in Chicago are not working. That's from a study from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee 
Mark Levin, 52% of black men in Chicago are not working. There's so much violence in Chicago because of the high family dysfunctionality. Anywhere from 65 to 75 to 80% of the families in many of the black communities are dysfunctional. There is violence in Chicago because of the failing schools. The Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, says schools are failing. That's our U.S. He came from Chicago. He says that these schools are failing our children. There is so much violence in Chicago because of the poor housing opportunities and community development opportunities in many of the black communities especially. There is so much violence because of the mass incarceration and we kind of teased the chief. We said, well, what did you do? When we all know that if a young white man had done the same thing, it would not have been an issue. There is so much violence in Chicago because of the nutritional deficiencies and Dr. Uh, Terry Mason spoke to that eloquently. There is so much in violence in Chicago because of the mental health deficiencies. Do you know that they had the nerve to close down Dr. Carl Bell? Dr. Carl Bell, the community mental health uh, uh, council on 87th Street is closed. And now, if you want to get good mental health services in Chicago, you have to go to Cook County Jail. But look what Tom Dart says. He said, my jails are full. He said, don't send me nobody. <laughs> He's telling the judges, yeah, look, the jails are full, unless you want me to let some of these other ones out, and you're not going to like that. And so we keep asking the question, why is there so much violence in Chicago when really we're asking the wrong question? The right question is, with those conditions, why isn't there more violence in Chicago? And so let me give you the tail of the tape. In 2012, we had 2,400 shootings. And right here, a study, uh, Johns Ludwig, University of Chicago, says that every gunshot wound, every gunshot wound in Chicago cost Chicago $1 million. $1 million, everything from emergency room service to long-term care, to societal costs, to lower property taxes. Uh, uh, Mr. Ludwig is, is at the, the criminal, the crime lab here at the university. One million dollars for every gunshot wound. And this is gonna go back to the monies that we do have and could invest. 510 murders, 513, 506, who's counting? But that's how many murders we had last year. We had 319 children shot here in the city of Chicago last year. 319 children, we had 108 murders of children here, city of Chicago last year. Children 19 and under, 108 of them were killed. Is that more than Newtown, Aurora, Columbine combined? It absolutely is last year. But we had, you know, and I love the police now, so y'all don't get me wrong. But our police chief, Gary McCarthy, one day this month, it was right after the uh, first of the uh, first of the month, he comes out and he says, crime is down and life is good. And on the same day he said it, we had a six month old gunned down in the streets of Chicago. So I get a little confused, you know. We've got this perfect storm to create violent conditions. And then we close down Brother Carl Bell. We close down Jobs for Youth. I don't know if you guys know what Jobs for Youth is or used to be. It's closed. We close down the Abraham Lincoln Center. We close down Hull House. Hull House had been around for 125 years. And now it's closed. Recently, I was in Washington, D.C., uh, and had the fortune to meet with Mr. Arne Duncan. And Arne, Mr. Duncan said to me, he said, Philip, do you know that 65% of all black males who drop out of high school 
will end up in prison. He didn't say might. He didn't, now, this is Arnie. He didn't say there was a, he said they will. And so I said, well, let me go back to Chicago and just make sure that all of our young black males are graduating. Guess what I found? Here in Chicago, only about one third of black males graduate from high school. That guarantees that you judges are going to be busy. It guarantees, and this is coming from Arnie, I mean, these are just numbers and statistics that people are throwing back and forth. It guarantees that the jails are going to be full, and it also guarantees the violence that we have here in the streets of Chicago. So let me tell you what doesn't work first, and I'm going to tell you what does work. Number one, doesn't work. Increasing police on the street with high-powered weapons, highly militarized, you know, crime-fighting equipment, helicopters, uh, uh, M16, laser guns, flash grenades. You've seen a lot of it uh, up in uh, uh, Watertown recently. That stuff is great for chasing a couple, but on the streets of Chicago, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. What doesn't work is arresting, incarcerating, and criminalizing these young men. It doesn't work. You're not going to stop the violence that way. Now, you can, you can arrest, you know what? Um, the chief, what's his, uh, Chief McCarthy said, we've got it under control. My men are doing new strategies. And the first warm weekend in April, they lit him up. <laughs> they, they said, no, we're not going for that. So you can't arrest your way out of this. You remember U.S. Uh, Attorney Patrick Fitzgerald? He was at the City Club of Chicago. And he saw Jody Weiss, the former superintendent. He said, uh, 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 Superintendent Weiss, you didn't ask me, but I'm going to tell you. You cannot arrest your way out of this violence problem. He said, I lock up people for a living. That's what I do. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have a chance. Number three, focusing mostly on drug and gang activity. First of all, the police are doing their gang strategies based off of a model that was created in the 1950s and 60s. That's not what these young guys out here are doing. In fact, uh, you remember uh, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, they flash mob North Michigan Avenue. And I don't know if you guys know Andrew Holmes. He's the guy who goes to all the sites. Andrew came on TV and said, man, them kids, not only did they beat up the police, they beat up his horse. <laughs> now, wait a minute. It was, it was on television. And so the police, you don't have a chance using those old strategies. Well, they don't. Number four, using university research to drive strategies for the streets. It, it's good for universities, if you're, but when you're on the streets, it's different, and you're going to have to use different strategies. Number five, intervening at the point of violence. You might stop it today, but you didn't really fix anything. Uh, number six, having the wrong people at the table. It doesn't work. And right now, in the city of Chicago, it is mostly the wrong people at the table to stop violence. So this is what does work. And then I'm going to get on out of here. Number one. Oh, well, first of all, let me tell you where I got this from. because. I'm not smart, and I can't figure stuff out. So I went to the, uh, uh, the uh, CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And they said, OK, yeah, we know how to stop violence. This is what we've been advocating for 70 years. I said, OK. Num <laughs> Number one, rebuild the family unit. And what they, the Centers for Disease Control, they said the family unit is the most important social unit of society. They said it's the brick, it's the building block of society. It says if you don't have intact, highly functioning family units, nothing else works. Your schools don't work, your, 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 your police can't do their job, your judges can't do their jobs. They said even your ministers can't do their jobs unless you have strong, functioning, highly functioning family units. Number two, in fact, even economically, you need families to have good economics, strong families. Number two, provide positive mentors and role models. These young boys today, 
out here, and it's mostly boys, but right now, these young girls starting to snap off. In fact, the, ki the, the kids who beat up the policeman's horse were girls. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So provide strong, positive mentors and role models. Do you know what the best mentoring organization in Chicago is now? At, at Black Star, we probably mentor 13, 14,000 kids a year with our different programs. The best mentoring organization in Chicago is Four Corner Hustlers, Vice Lords, Gangster Disciples, the Moles, the Blackstones, the Latin Kings, the Saints. Those are the best mentoring organizations we got. They get these kids when they're young, when they're two and three, and they teach them the colors. And by the time they're four, five, and six, they teach them the history of the crews. And by the time they're seven, eight, and nine, they start teaching them how the gang works. By the time these kids are 10 and 11, they're willing to kill for the gang. Now, that's good mentoring. I like that. It's just that I don't like the people doing it. But until we can provide better mentoring, we're going to keep getting a lot of what we've got. Number three. Arnie Duncan said it. Uh, Arnie Duncan said it. <laughs> he did. Arnie Duncan said, you got to educate them. Right now, you've all heard of the schoolhouse to jailhouse pipeline. And you know about Michelle Alexander and the new Jim Crow. And that's precisely what we're doing. We are educating, especially these young black boys, for incarceration. There's, there's, that's what's happening. And so rather than opening up more schools or improving the schools, we're closing the schools and we're taking away educational opportunities. And we know what the results are going to be. We, Arnie knows what the results are going to be, and so do you. And so what Arnie is saying, you've got to provide these young people with a globally competitive education. You can't make it no more. Here I am up on 65th and, and, and uh, King Drive in the McDonald's, and they got all Latinos working behind the counter now. Now, I'm not mad at my Latino brothers and sisters because they got to work too. But at least we used to be able to get a job at McDonald's on 65th and King Drive. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Now we can't do that no more. And then number four, and this is uh, uh, number four, the last thing. We've got to provide alternative economic alternatives to these young guys. So a lot of us like to go up to these young guys on a I don't know if you like to, but you, you, in your mind, you say, yeah, I'm going to, and then you don't. You want to go up to these young drug dealers and say, stop selling those drugs. Get off this corner and go get a job. That's what you say you want to do. But even if you did that, even if you did that, and you don't have something to offer that young man as an alternative, then you are wrong because you don't have the moral authority to tell him to stop feeding his kids, to tell him to stop paying his rent the best way he knows how. And so I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. We've got to stop this violence. But the Centers for Disease Control laid this out. I lay out one more thing. The churches have got to get in the game. Churches, y'all got to get in the game. Uh, we have this thing called take a young black male to worship. I asked one church, I said, can you get some young black male to come to your church on Sunday? And he's, the pastor said, well, I don't know any. I said, what about them guys out in front of your church selling drugs? Go get them. <laughs> so, uh, so that's it. That's it. That's, that's what we do at Black Star. We've got mentoring programs, tutoring programs, parenting programs, uh, peace in the hood programs. And if you got any problems with anything I said, see Vince. <laughs> <laughs>Let me just say that, uh, as some of you know, there has been an almost mythical relationship between young girls and horses. I'm glad to see you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you will hear from our last panelists. <laughs> it's late. You got to get keep it up. <laughs> we will hear from our last panelist, uh, Mr. Spicer from Finger. You do me a favor and just clap for everybody that's come out here today. This was an awesome second plenary session. Professor Conyers, thank you for putting this together.
Uh, please give her a hand for the great job that her team has done to put this great event together. Come on, y'all should stand up and clap because she took time to make this happen. And so you should give her her due now and her team for the great job that they have done. Come on and stand up and give her her due now. My name is Robert Spicer, and I'm here to, uh, I'm here as a fan of these great individuals that are here. I don't know if you noticed me taking pictures of them. Um, hope you don't mind. I, I, I'm a fan of you guys. Now I'm a fan of you now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mark, and Phil, you know, I'm on your listserv, so I get all the stuff. Go to VON, they're going to be on there talking some great stuff this, <laughs> this afternoon. And uh, Lena, you know how much I love you and care about the great work that you're doing. So I'm so glad to be on this panel with you. And to all of you, my brothers and sisters, I'm just grateful to be here because there was a time in my life where uh, I wouldn't be standing before you uh, because of a choice that could have happened to me when I first started at Christian Finger High School some three, four years ago. When I started there, I was not the uh, culture and climate specialist. I was the chief dean for restorative justice code switching and discipline, very long title. And in our work starting off at Christian Finger High School, uh, our school was in turmoil. Those that remember back in 2009 and the subsequent months after that, we, our school was in turmoil. Our school was going through a great travail. And I want to share with you a little story before I go into this PowerPoint about an incident that happened to me when I was the chief dean. I was in my office preparing for the day and we had a number of law enforcement agencies and other groups in my office talking with kids and working with young people. And this one young man uh, came into my office who was really in trauma. He was going through. And his grandmother and grandfather thought that if they just send him to the dean, I'd be able to resolve his matter. So I tried the best I could to resolve it. But the young man just wanted to see his father. He just wanted to see his dad. His dad has 20 kids. He's one of 20. And this weekend was going to be the weekend that he was going to go see his father. He was going to run away from his grandmother and grandfather who have custody of them, and he was going to go see his daddy, who travels all over the world. He's a DJ, and he does a lot of different things. And he said, I'm going to go see my dad this weekend. Well, but unfortunately, the SAS individuals, right, the mental health individuals were coming to get him because he was a child in turmoil. He was a child in, in trauma. And his grandparents weren't, didn't feel comfortable telling him that this was going to happen. And he realized the jig was up when he started seeing all these people start surrounding him and talking to him about sit down and calm down. And so he began to escalate. So that's when that, uh, uh, my colleague said, just send him to Mr. Spicer, he'll handle it. And so he came, you know, he came to me and I talked to him and I, and I tried to calm him down. And you know, I wasn't a culture and climate specialist at that time, I was the dean. So I thought if I use authority, if I use my authority as the dean, I, I could get him to calm down. Well, unfortunately, that authority had not worked. I had not developed more authority yet with the young people. They didn't see me as somebody that cared about them. They just saw me as another individual, another adult telling them what to do. And teenagers oftentimes don't like when adults tell them what to do. They're wired that way to tell you that they're going to do whatever they want to do and that you need to go sit down, which causes us to then as adults rise up and use adultism and say, no, you do what I say. And that's what I did. I said, you do what I say. I'm the dean, the pen. Mightier than the sword. I can send you away. I'm the dean. Well, he didn't care about that because he wanted to see his daddy. And so there was a point where we were talking back and forth, and I had not learned some of the different, you know, moves that you got to learn when kids are in crisis. They, they will, you know, lash out at you. So I didn't learn all that stuff pretty well. I didn't, I didn't expect the child to do anything. I just thought he was angry and upset. And I tried to calm him down. I tried to talk in a low voice. And the lower I got, the higher he got. And I said, boy, this is something. And nobody got up. None of the adults got up to say, you know, let's help Mr. Spicer. They figured, Mr. Spicer, he's the dean. He's going to figure it out. <laughs> and so they were all talking to the kids and talking and, you know, doing their business. The room was packed with different adults, but they were all working on other things with their students. And I told the young man, I said, look, man, don't leave. Don't leave. Just stay right here. And he said, Mr. Spicer, get out the way. I said, look, man, don't leave. Don't leave. Mr. Spicer, get out the way. I said, well, don't leave. And then all of a sudden, pop, punched me right in the jaw. I saw a light. <laughs> For one moment, I had risen up in myself 
to probably lash out back at him. But I didn't. I just grabbed him by his two hands, pushed him against the wall, and I told, and everybody in the room at that point stopped what they were doing. And I said, will somebody please go get the police officers? Will somebody go get somebody? Because I don't want this boy to hurt himself or hurt me or hurt anybody else. Then everybody started moving, got the young man the support he needed, and got him out of the room. Well, I stood there, and, you know, I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you when you were a kid and you were tough, and, you know, you were like, yeah, and you fell or hurt yourself or something happened to you, and as soon as you saw your mama, you just started to cry. How many of you ever had that happen to you? Well, the mama of our building was is Miss Elizabeth Dozier. She's the principal of Finger High School. And, and, and somebody told, you better go to the office, man. Ms. Spicer got punched in the face. And she came. And I was tough. I was like, man, that didn't hurt. Y'all going back to them kids. I got it. But when I saw my principal look at me with a face of just like utter just, oh, how could this happen? I just cried like a little baby. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't care about, you know, who was in the office. All I saw was her eyes looking at me with that look of like, oh, my gosh. How could this have happened? And it was at that moment that I realized that we need to do something different. We, adults, we need to change our approach. Because our young people are already accustomed to the approach that I used. And they already know what they're going to do to you. And they don't care about being locked up. They don't care about being pushed out because all their family's out there. So it don't matter. Push them out. They're going to be with Bobo and Yuck Yuck and Pumpkin and all their people. That's great. They got gas bill to pay. They got electrical bills to pay. So put me out on the corner. I don't need to be in school no way. Y'all don't love me anyway. Why should I be here? And so my principal, you know, after that situation, pulled me in the office and she said, Mr. Spicer, I'm changing your title to the culture and climate coordinator. And your role and responsibility is to do what I know you know how to do. You see, I worked with a community organization some time ago before I came to Christian Finger High School called Community Justice for Youth Institute. And in those 10 years, I learned all the things that I'm going to share with you in just a few minutes about restorative justice. We did it in the community, and we did some great things. Sally Wolf's in the audience. We did some great things. Right, Sally? Sally trained me. When I heard that I was going to be the culture and climate coordinator, it felt like a demotion. It felt, like I, it felt like I wasn't going to have the power and authority anymore to make the kids do what they're supposed to do. It felt like I was not going to have that. But what Brother Jackson just said about more authority is way more powerful than any legal authority anybody has. Because you have now built up relationship with these young people. And this is what this is the this is the the, 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 the genius of Elizabeth Doe. She said, I need someone on my team that can build that more authority. So now I as a principal can now utilize that as collateral to support these young people in their development. If everybody's talking about arrest, suspension, and kick out, and there's nobody saying, well, we got another way, then the young people are never gonna be uh, uh, pulled into the whole notion and possibility of them being the great young people that they can be. And that's what we do every day in that peace room at, at Christian Finger. We do it every day. We do it every day in all the rooms, in, in, in our classrooms, and in our gyms, in our lunch rooms, in the hallway. It's all about positive development. Building our young people up. Because what we see is they're being torn down by the media. They're being torn down by their families. They're being torn down by the, each other. And so school has to be seen as a place of peace, a place where young people can develop that muscle to now be loving toward each other. I said it. Yes, I did. Love. That's what needs to happen in our schools. We have to let them know that we care. Then they'll want to know what we know. But if you act like you don't care about them, then they don't want to hear what you have to say. They don't want to know what you know. But they want to know what the gangbangers know because they're feeding them, they're clothing them, and they're showing them love. We can learn from those guys, can't we? And take those very things, as you said, to use them and apply them to be able to help our young people be the best they can be. But let me run into this thing here and show you a little bit about what we've done. Just to give you a background of restorative justice, it's a philosophy. 
not a program. So it can't be taken away because of budget cuts or funding. It's a way of life. It's a way of being. It's a way you are. This is my life. Cut the budget if you want to. I'll be out here doing a peace circle someplace, helping somebody. Because this is about helping our young people to develop and grow. And these practices are aligned with the philosophy. And Atlanta broke all those practices down for you. And I'll share a little bit about that through, some other, through, through this PowerPoint. But it's basically about bringing the people that have harmed others together with the person that's been harmed in a face-to-face -face encounter so they can talk honestly about what happened and begin the whole process of rebuilding relationship. Sounds novel, right? Didn't, didn't we used to do that some time ago when we were young? And you had a fight with somebody and Big Mama would come. And didn't Dr. Mason talk about that, the woman up there? And, and, sh and they would come and they said, come on here. And they'd sit you around, give you some soup, and you pass the bowl around. He said, now why you hit that boy upside of here? Oh, he talked about my mama. What, 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 what? You know that you're not supposed to do that. You know, mama, you right. You know, say sorry. Okay, I'm sorry I didn't do that. And they go right outside and play. Because the young people forget about that real quick. Right? But we hold them to that. We keep them in that, that mess of unforgiveness and shame and we keep them there and then eventually they're going to fight and get out of that but it's going to be unhealthy so we have to show them ways to be able to build their, 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 their capacity to get out of the things that they've done you see it's not what you see that'll kill you it's what you can't see you see in the titanic they saw the iceberg but they didn't see what was under the water our uh, young people you, you see the young people but you don't see the trauma that's in there and so we try to deal with them old school, and it's a new school child. You can't deal with them the way we used to deal, like you used to deal with us. Seen and not heard nonsense. You can't do that. <laughs> These children are to be seen and heard, because if you don't want to hear them, somebody is going to hear them. And they're letting us know every day that they matter and that they value. And so restorative practices allows us to go under the surface. It allows us to go deep into what's going on with you. It's, it allows us to really support them in the whole notion as teenagers of what it is to become a teenager and how it is to move to become a young adult, which all of us have gone through. Am I right? How many can remember that it was the Lord that saved you from your silly self? <laughs> saved you. I've been in front of a few judges, and they saved you. Right? But it was also some judges, probation officers, teachers, coaches, mentors that saw potential in you, saw that you weren't just the surface, but there was greatness in you, kings, queens, princess, presidents in you, and said, okay, I'm going to mentor you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to grow you up. I'm going to start that little league. I'm going to recruit those young men. I taught third grade in Cabrini Green from 95 to 2003 because I heard a call that we need men in elementary school. I didn't know nothing about the resource in high school until I got the finger. And I said, shucks, I would have went to finger or, or high school first. Look at all these resources for the men. So I agree with you. We got to do different things in the elementary to bring those young men because those young ladies and men are still a part of my life. I got one writing a book. I got another one finished in college. I got another one that's about to be a teacher herself. And they say it all because we saw a man come to our school every day and tell us that we were somebody. Restorative practice at Christian Finger and its effects. So as I told you, we, <laughs> that position was created for me. I had somebody tell me, he said, oh, you know, you fix air conditions? <laughs> Shucks. Culture and climate, what? what, you fix air conditions? Oh, I had a lot of people make fun of that, you know. I was like, Miss Doe, can I please be dean again? <laughs> so when I saw they made me the dean of culture and climate, I said, that's my new title. I like that. We established a peace room where we had an opportunity to create a space where young people can come, no matter what they're doing, what's going on in their lives, they can come to that room and actually work on some of the restorative practices that help them deal with it. Because if their mind's not right, they're not going to learn anything that is going on in that classroom. And a lot of them are coming to me dealing with relationships, teen dating violence. You know, hey, you know, I love the boy, but he keep hitting me. Uh-oh, well, well, red flag. You're not supposed to do that. Let's, let's get you further supports. So it's a part of this whole process. And uh, Karen Lynn Morton, she's in the house, and she runs a variety of peace rooms all over the city. Come on, give her a hand. She does phenomenal work. All of this. She's right in the back. And she knows the power of it. So you make sure you see her. So the restorative conferences where it's one-on-one, -on -one, where we have these conversations, family group conferences, when we bring the families together. 
Do you know that some families are in crisis right now? And that they don't know where to go. Some of them don't want to come to church. Some are afraid because they fear that they'll be shamed and they would hear those words, oh, you, you're going down for what you're doing. But if you can create an opportunity for families to actually look at what's going on in their lives in a school and feel safe to do that, now you're building a relationship between that school and that family, which will help you to now deal with that young person and help that young person make better decisions. We use the peace circles, which is, a, which is an indigenous practice, which uh, 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 brings members together. And we use a talking piece. And the talking piece allows for individuals in the process to actually to speak, be heard and speak when you have the talking piece. So it helps to control the conversation. But more importantly, it helps to create opportunities for building community, building trust, building a sense of consensus on how we're going to deal with this matter, and then moving forward, forward in terms of building community. The peace ambassadors are a peer jury. Uh, which are young people that actually listen to cases. And then finally, the Boy Town Education Model, which focuses on teaching social skills. We got away from that, didn't we? Teaching young people social skills, teaching them how to say thank you, teaching them how to conversate. Didn't we used to have etiquette class at some point, right? How to you know, put your elbows on the table, how, not, how to use this fork instead of that fork. I mean, these things we, we stopped doing that we need to get back to. So what this caused was a ripple effect in our school community. So what we were doing in that room began to open up opportunities to do things in, in dramatic and powerful ways in other parts. And this is how it affected our numbers. How many of you like numbers and data? Right? Some of you like numbers and data. I do. And so for our student code of conduct, we looked at the group four, five, and sixes, which are the actual higher offenses that happen in schools in our student code of conduct. So our fours would be like extortion, fighting one-on-one, -on -one, right? Stealing something higher than $100, things like that. Group fives are intimidation, gang intimidation, you know, the very higher ones, the very higher levels. And then the sixes can be as high as murder, as, as low as extortion, or I mean uh, arson, well they're not low, but uh, you know, incidences that are really high and egregious that happen in schools. And so we had a lot of uh, uh, young people hitting us. I don't like to be hit, but they were show hitting us, and that's a six when you hit, a, hit a, a board employee, which is arrestable, and you get you put out of school and get you expelled. And a lot of kids were in crisis, and they, they saw us as the enemy. You know, the school was a turnaround school, and we were new staff, and you know, the kids were still the same kids, and we were the enemy because they lost their coach, they lost their teacher, they lost their friends, they lost their mentors, they lost all those people, and then we showed up smiling, talking about go to class. They said, we got something for you. So in those first few, <laughs> semesters. As you can see, the numbers were very high. We talked about the 375 plus arrests and the expulsions and the suspensions. And I was over that shop when we first started. But when we began to institute restorative justice in, in, in earnest in semester one, uh, uh, semester uh, 2011, uh, semester one and two, as you can see, there was a huge reduction as we began to institute that, but not only just what we were doing in the peace room, but also what was going on with our security officers. You know, our security officers are the first line of defense and offense. And our principal realized that we need to get our security officers to learn these techniques and to get them to begin to use some of these uh, uh, models to help them be able to build those relationships with those young people because they see them in the morning and they push them out in the afternoon. But if we do it gently and we do it with care, we can see that the young people will go to those security officers and say, hey, man, something's about to happen. Can you help me with this? Who can I talk to about this issue? And now instead of seeing them as security officers, now they're seen as security guides, guiding our young people through the day and making sure they not only get to class, but they get through the day and get to the after-school activities and even home. But what our principal realizes is that it can't just be about Mr. Spicer. Is that right? I'm not the savior. I'm, not, I'm just a servant. It, but it can't just be about one person. We have to get other people involved in this. So we began to get the deans involved because those are, that's where the incidences end up happening, right? They go right to the dean. And if the dean is, dean is thinking zero tolerance, then we're still going to see the pipeline. So we began to train our deans and began to tell the deans, Dean, you work with Mr. Spicer. And if you have an incident going on, 20% of your incidences have to come to Spicer. Now, they sent, them, they sent all of them to me. They don't even forget about 20%. They sent them all to me because they realized, they realized that in this whole process, we need to work together. And so, as you can tell, as we talk about first semester, you know, huge instances of arrests. 
But as we started to bolster and use the restorative conferences, which were the deans and the victim offender mediations and the peace circles, as you can see, it was a dramatic drop because we began to see we need to work as a team. And that's what this is. This is about team. This is about Finger High School, Elizabeth Dozier and her team that helped to bring about this dramatic change in our, in our school. So as I wrap up, restorative practices at Finger, these are the, different, these are the numbers that show very clearly using restorative practices as well as the education models that we have, these are the things that, that happen at our school. You saw a 10% increase in our attendance, 40% dropout rate. Uh, the, 40, the dropout rate went down 14%, which is key because high schools have been dropout factories where we have to begin and turn and rethink what high schools can be and turn them into drop-in factories where these young people drop in and get a, the quality education they deserve. The freshman on track numbers, this is very important. If all of you, our young people have all of their credits freshman year, we, we, that's a key indicator that they will graduate in four years. And when we inherited the school, it was 40%. By the time we finished that first two years, we jumped up to about 70.5. Our misconduct dropped by 80% because of what we talked about in terms of this team ethic, everybody working together on this. And then students being involved in after school activities, of course, we want all of our young people connected. And we had these huge peace rallies where we brought students together around peace, right? In that novel, just come together and talk about peace. Peace is the politician, and peace is what we want to see elected, right? And so these young people came together, and they formulated these great opportunities to come together for peace. Then we had Peace Week and Peace Month, always around when we have the breaks, because that's usually when they escalate and want to fight, right? So we'd have these opportunities to bring them together peacefully so that when they leave, they leave peacefully and they come back peacefully. And so we had a balloon release for peace uh, some time ago and we had a phenomenal time. This is the education model I talked to you about and so these are posted all over our school um, as a way of reminding our young people and then we also highlight different actual um, uh, 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 social skills as uh, social skills for the month. So we actually have the, the teachers and others really push that through their lessons and, and in the classroom. And as I said, these are the different practices that we do at Finger, as we talked about. And those that want to get started, these are some things that you can do to get started. If you want to do this in your school or in your church, in your community, identify a member of that team that could be that culture and climate specialist. Then get that person trained. I'll train them. Sally will train them. Community Just For You, Cheryl Graves will train them. We got plenty of trainers all around this room. We'll train them. Locate a peace room in your school, a place where the students feel safe to come and speak. And then finally, recruit some students to actually help and support this initiative because the students don't run it, it's, it's going to fall apart. And start collecting qualitative and quantitative data so that when you go to your higher ups, you can let them know, look at what's happening and this is how this is working to create a culture in our school. And then bring your staff along for this journey because that's what it is. These are the resources. These are the people that you can talk to. Um, I just thank you so much for listening and being a part of this great <laughs> plenary session. I hope I didn't go over too long. Come on, give everybody on this panel a hand. Come on, stand up and give everybody a hand for the great work. Come on, give everybody a hand because give yourself a hand too. You guys are phenomenal. And thank you so much.